Good morning, y'all. My name is Wesley. I'm one of the, the pastors here, and it's good to be with you all this morning. Now, has anyone ever had a nickname that didn't exactly capture the best or perhaps even the most accurate parts of who you are? Anyone has been in that situation before? I know I have. I'm sure I'm not alone in this. In high school, I got a nickname that stuck with me, uh, thanks to my brother. Uh, my brother was a senior at the time. I was a freshman. And so, uh, as it was tradition with the baseball team, the seniors would pick out fitting nicknames for the freshmen uh, that would then stick with them to the duration of their high school. And so, they were, were trying to come up with the names. I'm not going to share the names of, of some of these because they're not very appropriate for church, um, but I'll at least I'll share mine. So, as we were, uh, as we were going through the process, my, I knew my brother, and I knew him well enough to know that, that they were trying to pick out names that would at least have some kind of correlation with things that we loved or things that they could identify with us. And one thing that my brother knew I loved, you guessed it, uh, was Lord of the Rings. So you can imagine that I'm thinking, okay, well, my brother's gonna be kind to me, right? He's gonna pick out a cool name. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe he'll call, you know, maybe I'll get the name Legolas, you know, that's cool, um, because of, of, of my accuracy with the baseball, you know, or maybe Aragon, right, because of my just natural leadership skills I had, or, uh, or maybe Gandalf, because I was, I was mature beyond my years. Um, but no, my brother took the other approach, which was the funny approach, which is the make fun of my younger brother approach. And he decided that the, collectively the group would call me Smeagol. <laughs> and I have to tell you, the name stuck um, for four years of my high school. Now, that was a way of my brother getting back at me. However, when we were seniors, we returned the favor to the freshmen, so it came back full circle. Now, I share that to us because our friend today, Thomas, knows a thing or two about getting the short end of the stick when it comes to nicknames. He goes down in history as Doubting Thomas, all because of one moment in his life. I mean, can you imagine that for a moment? That's like calling Michael Jordan missing Michael because he missed a few shots in his career. That's like calling Beethoven tone-deaf Beethoven because he struggled early on in his career. I mean, in one moment, and our friend gets a bad rap. And the, fa- the famous painting that we'll see up here of Doubting Thomas and the incredulity of St. Thomas by Caravaggio, the title literally means inability or unwillingness to believe. That is who Thomas is. That is how history remembers him, as this man who doubted. Now, doubting is not something that only Thomas does in the Bible. In fact, lots of people doubt. John the Baptist, who Jesus himself says is the greatest prophet, doubted Jesus because he didn't meet his expectations in Luke chapter 7. James, Jesus' own brother, doubted him so much to the point that he accused Jesus of losing his mind in the Gospels. And even after the resurrection, in, in, in Matthew 28, as we hear the, this, this famous passage called the Great Commission, even then, after people were seeing Jesus and hearing his teaching, some still were like, mm, not quite sure. Doubting is not something that is unique to Thomas. And yet, he gets this bad rap. You see, I think there's a reason why John saves this story right at the end before he gives his purpose for the book. I think there's a reason why Thomas' story leads right into this crescendo moment where, where John says the purpose of his gospel is to help people believe. Look at verse 30. He says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, I think by putting Thomas' story right there before this, what John is saying is that out of all the stories written down, this may be the best example of someone who couldn't believe, who learned to believe. And the key to understanding this story today is that Thomas' story does not end in doubt. We should probably get a better nickname for him, right? Because, in fact, Thomas makes one of the clearest, one of the boldest confessions of faith found in the entire Bible. You see, Thomas' journey today will show us that doubt doesn't mean the end of faith. It can actually be the beginning of a deeper belief. And you see, our main idea is going to flow straight from the text here. We're just going to... We're gonna, exactly what I think John wants us to hear this morning is that this text is pointing to the reality so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, straight from the text this morning. And we're going to hear from Thomas's story today so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Today we're going to see how Jesus teaches us to deal with our doubts. And in doing so, we're going to see how true belief in, in him can lead us to a life of surrender 
in a life of mission, just like our dear friend Thomas. Our text is going to flow straight from, or our outlook is going to flow straight from the text today. We're going to have two points. It'll be pretty simple today. Number one, we're going to get the doubter in us all. I say we all doubt. And then number two, the response to our doubt. How do we respond to the doubter in us all? Now, as we dive into the text, let's go uh, straight to the text here, verse 24. And as we get there, just by way of recap, where we are in the passage today, where we are in the story, the narrative of Jesus. This is one of Jesus' appearances following his resurrection. On Thursday night, Jesus is arrested. Friday afternoon, Jesus is crucified and laid in a tomb. And then, as we saw last week on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene visits the tomb. And what does she find? She finds that it's empty. And in a panic, what does she do? She runs to tell Peter and John. And they have a foot race back to the tomb to confirm her reports. And we saw last week, as, as Peter and John arrive, they, they see this, these details, these very unique details. They find that the, the burial linens are, are folded neatly, you know? It wouldn't make sense if, if the body had been stolen, right? Because, I don't know about you, but grave robbers are not known for tidying up. And then John begins to, to realize that, okay, Jesus is risen, just a promise. And later that day, Jesus meets Mary Magdalene at the tomb and reveals himself to her. And then Jesus appears to the other women on their way to Bethany. And then Jesus appears to two followers on the road to Emmaus. And then he appears to Peter. And then we get to that evening. And that evening, Jesus appears to the rest of the disciples as they're gathered together, except for one, Thomas. Thomas is the only disciple who's not there. He misses out on this encounter, and that's where we pick up in verse 24. Now, Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, which is another probably name for him or nickname. Perhaps he had a twin, perhaps not, but he was called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Sounds like my kids sometimes when they make absolute statements about things. I will never. Eight days later, he says, verse 26, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And we get to verse 24 here, and we learn that Thomas has missed out on this gathering of the disciples where Jesus appears to them a week prior to what's happening here. And while we don't know, we don't know exactly why he missed out. Perhaps he was afraid. Perhaps he was just so distraught because the, the Christ that he loved died that he just was overwhelmed with emotion. Perhaps he's simply given up. Whatever it was, we don't know. But we do know this was no ordinary gathering. Because during this appearance, the disciples saw the risen Lord, the same disciples who were with Jesus, who saw the crucifixion, who heard his teachings, who were called by him, have seen the risen Lord. In this moment, they, they are, they, something critical has happened. They are being commissioned as apostles, as those who have seen the resurrected Christ. This is no just routine resurrection appearance, as, as if there was such a thing, right? The apostles were getting, we might call the, the royal treatment here. I mean, they've heard Jesus. They've seen him perform miracles. They saw him go to the cross. They saw him fulfill the scriptures. And now they're seeing him resurrected, leaving no doubt that Jesus is alive. This is important to us because Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, tells us that the apostles are the foundation of the church and our faith. What they saw, what they heard, what they engaged with the risen Christ, they received the gospel directly from Jesus, and then they proclaimed it. And after they died off, their teachings of the apostles were recorded in what's called the scriptures, the written evidence of the good news of Jesus that we have today. But for one week, our dear friend Thomas was in the same place that you and I are in today. He had to rely on the testimony of the apostles without seeing the resurrected Christ with his eyes. In verse 25, the disciples are telling Thomas, look, brother, we've seen the Lord. And in the Greek there, it actually shows that they just didn't do it once. They were repeatedly telling him, they're insisting, we have seen him. We have, we have, he's alive, Thomas. We've experienced him. But Thomas is full of doubt in this moment, right? Thomas' response to them is, no, <laughs> I won't believe it. It's almost like a back and forth tennis match, right? They're like, Thomas, he is risen. And Thomas doesn't say he is risen indeed. Thomas says, no, I don't believe. Every time they bring, again, the testimony of the risen Christ. Have you ever felt like Thomas before? Or, or maybe you know someone like this, someone who would say, you know what, I'll never believe 
unless I experience blank for myself. I will never believe unless, no matter what the other disciples said to Thomas, he refuses to believe. And there's this one little word that resonates with the doubter in all of us this morning, and that is that word, unless. Because all of us, deep down inside, we crave evidence. Whether it's empirical evidence or existential evidence. Empirical evidence being the, the, the type of evidence that, we, that can prove something, that we can observe, we can measure, we can confirm it with our senses, and that's exactly what Thomas is asking for. He says, unless I can see it, unless I can touch it, unless I know it's real, I won't believe. You see, in this passage, Thomas is essentially saying, look, unless Jesus proves himself on my terms, faith is for fools. Unless Jesus comes and he proves himself on my terms, what I need, it, it, faith is for fools. I, I don't want to believe the testimonies of others. You see, this is precisely the attitude that reflects our current culture, does it not? Where skepticism and cynicism are virtues over faith. And Jesus is addressing this mindset. He's not, look, Jesus doesn't come in this moment. He's not confronting, actually, the doubt in Thomas. He's confronting the cynicism in Thomas. Because there is something danger, dangerous about skepticism and cynicism. The refusal to believe unless God proves himself on our terms. That's why he tells Thomas at the end of verse 27, do not disbelieve Thomas, but believe. In other words, he's made it clear to Thomas, I am your creator. I am the one. It's not the other way around. You, 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 don't, you don't tell me how to be God. I am the one. I am the Lord. You see, faith requires us to trust him beyond our senses and, and in what our experiences tell us, which is exactly what Hebrews 11 teaches us, right? That faith is defined as the evidence of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is not built on our performances, not built on our good works, it's built on trusting in Jesus. And what he's calling us to do is believe even when things seem unbelievable. And this seemed very unbelievable to Thomas, right? In this moment, it seemed very unbelievable to Thomas. But the twist is that the implausibility of Christianity is actually what makes it plausible. The beauty of this, the very things that seem unbelievable in the gospel, are actually what makes it believable. What makes it ring true this morning for us. Because no one would invent a religion like this. No one would make up a story like this. As C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity is not the sort of thing anyone would have made up. It is the surprising upside-down nature of what Jesus does in the Gospels that makes it profoundly believable. And it's why millions and billions of people around the world believe today. You see, the truth is we're all going to experience our doubt in life. We all experience with this. There's a doubter in all of us. No matter who you are this morning, there is doubt present. It's part of being human. The question is not whether we doubt, but the question is what do we do when it happens? What do we do with that doubt? How do we wrestle with it? There's a virtuous way of wrestling with it, which we'll see in just a minute. Think of kind of like Mark 9, you know, where the dad says, I believe, but help my unbelief. But there's also another way to deal with our doubt. It's the way of cynicism. It's the way which Thomas deals with this. It's putting demands and conditions on God. Unless, God, you meet my demands, I will never believe. I mean, think about this for a moment. Thomas had witnessed Jesus' miracles. He had seen Jesus. He had heard his teachings. And yet, he still says, I will not believe unless you meet me on my demands. You see, what we're seeing here is not just doubt in Thomas. We're seeing a stubborn, willful disbelief. It's the same lie that the serpent told us in the garden. God isn't good, and he's not worthy of your trust. Trust yourself. Don't, don't trust God. Trust yourself. And that's like precisely, again, what our culture encourages us today. And that's the problem of skepticism, of cynicism. It requires us to either bury our heads in the ground and not live in reality, or live with intellectual dishonesty. dishonesty because, look, the reality is the facts were there for Thomas. The evidence was there. He didn't need more evidence for the resurrection. The evidence was present for him. And the same is true for us today, right? I'm not going to give an apologetics here of the, the evidence for the resurrection. But the point is, is that Peter wrote, and he says, we did not follow cleverly invented fables, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. The apostles were so convicted of the truth 
and that they were willing to give their very lives rather than recant their testimony. You see, Thomas wasn't being asked to believe some random story suddenly invented by other disciples. Faith isn't about believing something that we know isn't true. It is not a blind leap into the dark. Faith is not, like, a, like some people say, well, I, I just wish I could have faith. I wish I could have faith like you, Wesley, as if it's like a condition, you know, like, like, it's, like it's asthma or something, you know. Some people are predisposed to it and others are not. That's not what faith is. Faith is, is not believing, it's not the ability to believe something that's untrue, unproven. Faith is the appropriate response to what we know is true. And faith in Jesus doesn't mean that we don't have our doubts. It means that we wrestle with them and that we trust God through them. Not because we have all the answers, but because Christ has proven himself trustworthy. So what's really going on with Thomas? What's really beneath this for Thomas? I mean, the evidence was there for him. All of his close friends who he had spent years with are looking at Thomas and saying, Jesus is alive, we have seen him. Thomas has experienced miracles like Jesus walking on water, raising the dead, feeding 5,000. So what's really going on with Thomas? See, I think Thomas's doubt points to something much deeper than just lack of evidence or disbelief. It's pointing to an internal struggle. That he has faith, it's just buried deep under disappointment and hurt. And you know, the reality of this, I think one small clue helps us understand this, is that Thomas, it says, is still with the disciples eight days later. I mean, think about that for a moment. If he didn't believe at all, why would he stick around? If he didn't believe at all, why would he be with these crazy friends who are telling him that Jesus just rose from the dead? See, Thomas's lingering presence suggests that he's wrestling with faith, not rejecting it. And it's not that different from perhaps how we feel today. You ever wrestled with the reality, does God, does God love me even in my doubts this morning? Is God, has he forgotten me this morning because I doubt? If you're wrestling with those questions, I just want to tell you the simple answer is you're still here. And the fact that you are still here working through those questions is the evidence that God is working in your heart. See, wrestling with doubt is not a sign of failure. It can actually be a sign of authentic faith. Because we see honest wrestling all over the scriptures. So what is Thomas's struggle here? What is he really struggling with? It's not a lack of evidence. The evidence is all there for him. See, Thomas wasn't doubting based off empirical evidence. He wasn't even doubting the power of God. I think Thomas is doubting God's love for him in this moment. He's, does God care about me? Has he forgotten me? Has he, have, have I been left out? Think about it for a moment. Thomas was loyal. Thomas was loyal to Jesus. In fact, in John chapter 11, after, after Jesus raises Lazarus and he's going to Jerusalem and the disciples are like, no, 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 Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem. You're going to die there. Thomas is the one who steps up with courage and says, let's go die with him in Jerusalem. And now after Jesus rose, Thomas is the one disciple left out of this first encounter. Imagine how that would feel. It's like missing out on a celebration with your closest friends. It's like being the one friend who didn't get in the group selfie, right? You weren't there. It didn't happen. Man, he thought he was a close friend, but it seemed like Jesus had left him behind. That is a wound Thomas is carrying here. Has God forgotten about me? Does he still love me? Does, is he still for me? And we see that Jesus meets him here and addresses his wound. Look at the response to Thomas's doubt. Verse 28. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Man, Thomas' encounter with Jesus tells us something pretty powerful about doubts and faith and surrender. There is no higher expression of faith in John's gospel than this. This proclamation, my Lord and my God. It is the culmination of everything that John's gospel has been leading to at this moment. It's the acknowledgement that Jesus is not just some good moral teacher, not just some miracle worker. He is the divine king whom we owe our lives to. All through John's gospel, Jesus has been revealing his identity as God. John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. John chapter 14, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. These claims were huge. They were monumental, and many turned their backs on him because they found it too difficult to accept. 
But Thomas' words here, my Lord and my God, is the ultimate response to Jesus' self-revelation. Because Thomas shows us here that when Jesus meets us in our doubt and our wounds, it is not just an intellectual assent to believe the evidence before us. It is a personal surrender. My Lord and my God. And Jesus turns to him and says to him after he proclaims this truth, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. It's like a subtle rebuke there to Thomas. But there's even a better promise for us. Because in that moment, Jesus shifts from looking at Thomas to looking at all of us today. None of us have seen the risen Christ in person or in the flesh. And yet he still stands with us today, leading us to the same response as Thomas my Lord and my God. You see, when Jesus says, blessed are those, blessed are those, we don't want to just run past that that word there for a moment. Uh, The the word blessing there sometimes could just be translated as happiness, but I, I think it means much more than that. To be blessed is to experience the peace and the presence and the favor of God. I mean, think about Numbers 6 for a moment. This is a great example of what it means to be blessed by God. Number six is this benediction that we say sometimes. It's, it, it's written in this poetic form. It's essentially repeating the same sentiment in different ways. It says, may the Lord bless you and keep you, or another way of saying it, the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Here's one more time. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In other words, what does it mean to be blessed? To be blessed is to behold the face of God this morning. To be blessed is to be in the presence of God, to be an awareness that he has loved you and he has kept you. It is not just a general happiness. It is a deep contentment. It is the very peace of God, knowing that God is with you. So when Jesus tells Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, he's telling us today, we believe because God is here. We have experienced the very presence of God, the very peace of God, He has kept us. He has demonstrated his love for us. He has opened up our eyes to see who he is. He has testified to the truth about who he is to our very souls this morning. Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Now, how do we arrive at such a faith this morning? How how do we, like Thomas, how how can we move from, from struggling with doubt to surrender. How do we make that jump? Well, I just want to pull out a few observations as we close here. Number one, it begins by listening to the apostles. You know, if you notice in verse 25 again, the disciples are repeatedly telling Thomas, we have seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. And Jesus comes on the scene, and look, he doesn't rebuke Thomas for doubting, he rebukes him for refusing to listen to the testimony of the apostles. And the truth here is, if you want to strengthen your faith, we too have to immerse ourselves in the scriptures, listening to the words of the apostles. You see, one of the reasons why John, I think, puts this right at the end of this climax of his gospel is to show us that we can trust the witnesses of this book and to show us the true nature of the gospel. It's transformative power. It is a message that is not just a group of teachings for us. It is a message rooted in something done for us in history. It is the word of God. And the witness of the Holy Spirit to us today is not that we would just know the truth about God objectively or intellectually, but that we would know him relationally. And that is the wonderful thing about God, is it not? That he wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. And he has provided a way for us to do that through his word. He wants you to encounter him on the pages of scripture. That is his invitation to you today. If you struggle with doubt, If you struggle with fear and failure this morning, he wants you to go to his word and to experience the life-changing power of meeting Jesus in the word. That was his invitation to me as a 17-year-old who was wandering from God. And someone sat next to me and opened the Bible to me. In that moment, the spirit of God began to open my eyes and I received his grace for the very first time and I've never been the same. He can do that for you too. Listen to the apostles. Number two, witness the patience of Jesus. Witness the patience of Jesus towards you this morning. Verse 27, Jesus appears to Thomas and he meets Thomas exactly where he is. You notice that? Man, Jesus is so gracious. He doesn't cast Thomas aside for his his doubt. He comes into the room. 
And it's almost as if he comes to the room just for Thomas in this moment. And he invites Thomas to even go ahead with his processing, with his examination. But know something really profound about this. Jesus knew what Thomas had said even before he was present with him. He knew Thomas's doubts already. He knew what Thomas had voiced. This reminds us that Jesus has been with Thomas all along. He was listening to his doubts, and he was waiting patiently for him to come to faith. And the same is true for us this morning. Jesus knows your doubts, he knows your fears, he knows your failures, and yet he loves you and he's with you. He's not abandoning you in those moments. That's where the grace of God actually wants to meet you this morning. That's where he wants you to encounter his grace. You see, it wasn't just so much the empirical evidence of the empty tomb that, that changed Thomas. No, no, it was the presence of the living God that changed him. He is patient with us. Number three, look at his wounds. Look at his wounds this morning. You see, Jesus doesn't just show up and demand that Thomas believe in him. Now, what does he do? He shows his wounds to him. This is so crucial. It, it shows that God doesn't ask for our obedience from a distance this morning. He is a God who suffered, who bears the marks of his love for us this morning. And it is the sight of a wounded God who bled and died for us that can break through the resistance and the doubt in our heart and draw us to him. And that's what happened with Thomas. Have you seen and felt the wounds of Jesus for you this morning? You see, his wounds give us an ability to trust him even in the midst of our doubts. Look, life is going to disappoint you in so many directions. People are going to let you down in life. But his wounds prove that he will never let you down. Is there anyone who has loved you like Christ has loved you? A God who loves you so much that he loved you while you were his enemies is a God you can trust when he calls you his friend. A God who is willing to be tortured and even die for you so that you can be saved and forgiven of your sins is a God that you can rest assured will never abandon you today. So even those moments of darkness, even the moments of uncertainty, even the moments of doubt, you can hold tightly to his nail-scarred hands this morning, knowing that he is with you and he can carry you through the trial. Look at his wounds. And fourthly, drop your conditions this morning. Let's drop our conditions. You'll notice something here, that when Jesus comes and he reveals himself to Thomas and he tells Thomas, he's like, look, touch, come, sit, examine. You notice what the text doesn't say Thomas does? He doesn't actually touch Jesus. He doesn't actually follow through with it. I think our, 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 our dear friend Caravaggio got it wrong in that picture. Right? You see, as soon as Jesus offers his hands and his side to Thomas, says, look, you want to touch, you want to see if it's real? Thomas drops his conditions. They just fall away. He doesn't need a touch anymore. He simply proclaims, my Lord and my God. And oftentimes, look, we do the same thing. We approach God with conditions. I believe if this, I believe if this happens. But real faith comes when we drop those conditions and we surrender fully to him. You see, unless Jesus becomes your Lord and your God this morning, not just a helper in times of trouble, not just a good moral teacher, then you haven't fully understood what it means to be a Christian. Because what John is calling us to is to go from skeptic to surrender this morning. And doubt is surely part of that process for all of us. It's not, a, it's not an if we doubt or when we doubt, it's, it's what do we do with that that matters? How do we wrestle honestly with God this morning like Thomas, which is part of authentic faith? And part of wrestling with our doubt is not the need for more evidence. Thomas had all the evidence he needed but it's an encounter with the risen Christ and surrendering to him as Lord and God. And like Thomas, when we see that Jesus is not just the, the Lord of the universe out there, but he is my Lord and he is my God, then we can experience the peace and the hope of joy that comes from following him. And see, when we drop our conditions, then we can trust God's plan for our lives as well. We can step into the kind of faith that Thomas discovers here. You know, Thomas being excluded from that first encounter, it, it hurt, it was frustrating. It left a deep wound for him, but it wasn't a mistake. It was part of how God would glorify himself through Thomas's life. And look, the truth is for all of us, we're going to have those moments in life that we don't know what God is up to in our lives, but we got to embrace this truth this morning that whatever assignment God has given us, it is the most important assignment because he has chosen it for us and he is with us in it. And for Thomas, look, he, did, he may never have written the gospel like John. He may have gotten the worst nickname known to man for a Christian. 
But you know what he did do with his life? He went to India with the gospel. And now millions of Christians in South India trace their spiritual lineage back to him. Because of this, because of this encounter of the resurrection of the living God, Thomas carried the gospel to India. And furthermore than that, Thomas would take wounds in his body for Jesus. He would take a spear while he was praying on a hill. He gave his everything for Jesus because he knew Jesus had given his everything for him. You see, when we see Christ's wounds like this, then we too, like Thomas, we don't have to doubt again if God loves us or if he's for us. His life reminds us that that belief in the resurrection not only changes us, but it puts us in God's unstoppable mission in this world to proclaim his name, just like Thomas did. So look, as we come to the Lord's table today, my question is simply this, what about you this morning? What about me this morning? What conditions are we holding on to this morning that are keeping us from fully surrendering and trusting Jesus? If his resurrection truly changes everything, then it is a call for us in faith and in mission and surrender to him. And when we see his wounds, what he has done for us on the cross, and we see his resurrection this morning, and we believe in him, he can release our doubts. He can step us into a calling, and we can say with confidence, just like Thomas this morning, my Lord and my God, will you believe this morning? And will you live like it's true this morning? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that we can see your goodness in this story, Lord. And we pray, God, that we would trust, we would surrender to you in this moment, all of us, Lord. We would see your wounds, we would see what you have done for us. And instead of putting demands upon you, Lord, that we would surrender to you. We'd be freed, Lord, this morning from the fear and the doubt and the sin that entangles us this morning, God. We place our hope in the one who has died for us, in the one who has conquered death for us. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you.